Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our today's mm. webinar together with the Quakers group. Uh, my name is Rudolf mm. Sings, one of the founding partners of Quantera Global, and we'll be discussing together with Chief Maralingam the trans pricing in the Middle East and North and Central Africa with a bit of flavor uh, out of Western Europe. So welcome everyone. Um, so today, uh, Rudolf Schiff will be accompanied by uh, Jan, Jan Royakers, uh, one of our youngsters here on board. Um, and welcome that he is with us, because if not, then this would not be possible at all. Um, I would like to give the helm to Schiff. Schiff, please, you go ahead. Thank you, Rudolf. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, very honored to be here today speaking at this webinar. For those of you who don't know me, I've been working in transfer pricing for almost 25 years now. I've been helping multinational groups with their transfer pricing design, dispute resolution, certainty. And as I said, I'm honored to be speaking alongside Rudolf and Jan and the, the Quantera team today. We're going to cover only a few slides, but obviously there's a lot of detail that we'll weigh into, of course. Uh, if you have specific questions, or as always, please do ask them through the link or send us a note afterwards and we can always provide more uh, more information. But by way of introduction to the seminar, we're going to be covering a lot of transfer pricing changes in the region, Middle East and Africa. This is quite a sizable economy. In the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, you have a one point five trillion economy uh, in terms of size and scale uh, and Africa is another two and a half trillion US dollars uh, so sizable groups and the the regulations we're seeing in transfer pricing have come about for three uh, key kind of um, critical factors one is a desire to continue to encourage foreign direct investment on the slide, Michael, into yeah. the regions and uh, you know many of the territories in the region are you know, part of the World Trade Organization, of course, and the degree of cross-border trade you know, will depend on a number of those factors. And one of those is a common international tax standard, of course. Um, the, the other point I wanted to make was the, the EU blacklisting. Now, I've sat and worked with a lot of Ministry of Finance and tax authorities in the region. And, um, you know, they the view is that they're not happy that they're on this particular blacklist. So that has been a, another factor in leading to these uh, these regulations. And then the final element which we'll come on to in more detail is the, you know, the BEPS inclusion framework and, and has signing that has given a commitment to territories in the region to introduce these regulations. So that's just a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. R Rudolph, I don't know if you wanted to run through the the agenda there as well in a little bit more uh, detail. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. So um, ba basically uh, we'll be discussing um, uh, the transfer pricing uh, flavors around the, the transfer pricing regs in the in the jurisdictions that uh, that Chief will uh, touch upon. Uh, basically the, the next uh, slide that is on deck already. Uh, we will make a bit of comparison with the OECD transfer pricing guidelines that we uh, out of Western Europe uh, are, are quite uh, uh, aware of. Obviously, Schiff uh, has the very same uh, uh, ex experience as we have, but then uh, from a different background. So we'll be discussing uh, along the way also uh, which different flavors that that we that we encounter. She will certainly uh, touch upon the uh, the growth, so to say, of his market uh, in terms of uh, OECD regs, uh, how the other countries uh, are developing in that uh, in that sense. That's also critical uh, out of Western Europe uh, because aligned with, with OECD typically makes life with uh, with a multinational uh, group um, uh, more easy. For instance, we see the similar uh, position uh, arising out of Brazil currently. We will be touching upon a bit of uh, transfer pricing audit uh, triggers in the region as well. So uh, give you a bit of hand out um, uh, what to uh, to look for, to take care of. <coughs> and finally, we'll be also uh, be discussing a bit of pillar one and two, something that may be um, uh, implemented late 2021 perhaps, but the impact is such that uh, it should be part of a presentation like this. So far, and I would like to hand over to Shiv again, please. Thanks, 
Oh, no, I appreciate that. The, so the you can see the the map that we have here. So that what we've done is listed out the territories that have introduced transfer pricing regulations, and, and all of those regulations have been either introduced or updated in the last two years, perhaps. So they're all very new regulations. The, the color coding there, where we've shaded something in amber, of course, is where you have a transfer pricing commitment, but there's no corporation tax, such as the UAE. Or, uh, or Bahrain, for example. So obviously that would manifest itself as country by country reporting, but no transfer pricing documentation at this present moment in time. Uh, as Rudolf mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about the Pillar 2 proposals and what that could mean for corporation tax in the UAE and Bahrain uh, a little bit later on. The, it's worth covering the IF commitment as well. I mentioned the blacklisting of certain territories here in the Middle East. Now that's an EU initiative. Um, and I've, I've got a little uh, little note here. So Bahrain, for example, were added to the blacklist, the EU blacklist in December 2017. They brought in regulations uh, and then were removed subsequently in 2018. Likewise, Oman were only just recently uh, taken off that blacklist. I believe there's only five or six countries still on that list globally. Uh, and Oman, one of the latest uh, jurisdictions to introduce country by country reporting last month. Uh, and were subsequently taken off that blacklist. And the UAE were added in way back in December 2017 and removed in October 2019 after bringing in uh, various regulations. A lot of the uh, participants today will be aware of the inclusion framework commitment, which has now been signed by over 135 countries. A lot of countries have signed that commitment, uh, which shows the, the force that it has uh, globally. And that commitment is to introduce the four minimum standards. So out of the 15 BEPS action points, we have countering harmful tax practices, prevention of tax treaty abuse, um, transfer pricing guidance and country by country reporting uh, and mechanisms to make dispute resolutions more uh, more effective and more efficient going forward. So, so this is what we've uh, this is really the journey we've had and uh, why we now have these regulations in the in the Middle East and North Africa and Central Africa. I've, I've added there as well, Algeria haven't signed the, uh, the IF commitment, but have still brought in transfer pricing regulations. So the IF <coughs> commitment is a good kind of precursor to bringing in the regulations, but of course it's not a requirement to bring in transfer pricing regulations also. We, we will t um, go on to subsequent slides and talk a little bit about, uh, as Rudolf mentioned, the differences with the with the OECD and, uh, and the like, but let's pause here. Um, Rudolf, do you have any questions for me on this on this slide, or are you uh, happy to move on? Um, perhaps a, a brief question uh, that may be beyond uh, transfer pricing a bit. Um, uh, Chief, as, as the countries are say developing uh, transfer pricing, perhaps towards uh, the OECD uh, language, so to say, <coughs> how, are, how are countries uh, developing uh, something like corporate income tax and, and also uh, their international tax scheme in terms of tax treaties? How is that um, processing? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's, it's a good question. And as part of the commitment for uh, the minimum standards, the the treaties, the treaties and the exchange mechanism are a very big part of that. And you you do find that you know every month new countries and territories are added to the lists that you know where you can exchange information with those territories in the Middle East and Africa. So that that is increasing at quite an astronomical rate. And the OECD, of course, have a peer review process. Uh, which again, it's not part of the EU blacklisting that I mentioned, but it is part of the IF commitment that there will be <coughs> peer reviews to make sure that um, there is a good exchange of information. And what you do find when you delve into the peer review analysis for these territories, Rudolf, you find that they score very highly on things like security, uh, information, etc. But where they don't, and this is a generalization, of course, it will vary from territory to territory, but one thing we do see is that score not so highly on the speed at which you exchange the information. Uh, that's something that uh, is, is certainly in need of uh, being improved in this part of the world. Yeah. And sorry, you mentioned the corporation tax. I think we'll, we'll save that, I think, for the Pillar 2 discussion, uh, because that is something that I get asked about all the time, about whether we will have a corporation tax. Uh, we'll save that one as a, as a, for, the, for the end. <laughs> Okay, for the slide, uh, Jan. Okay, so another question we get asked a lot um, is, you know, the regulations that have come in, do they respect the OECD guidance? Are there any, you know, significant departures, etc.? So what 
what I've done is I've isolated some of the key uh, di differences. So let's just start with the good news. There's a lot of consistency in what I'm seeing in this part of the world uh, in terms of transfer pricing regulations and the OECD guidance. And that's that's obviously a very good, a very positive thing for businesses operating in the region. Um, so th let's talk a little bit about some of those differences that we do see. The selection of transfer pricing methods. So when we look at transfer pricing regulations, you know, the core methodologies that are laid out in the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, the, the light blue book that we have here on the page, those methods are respected and they are enshrined in the guidance and regulations in, uh, that we see here. However, there is a clear preference with tax authorities for more simple methods, I would say, nothing too overly complex. And, and a cut method is really at the at the forefront of that. Uh, and, and one example of that is the most recent Qatar transfer pricing regulations. There's a requirement to get a letter of authority from the GTA, from the tax authorities in Qatar, if you're not using the cut method. So that's clearly seen as the, you know, the, the starting point. <coughs> and if, we, if we're not using the cut method, we can demonstrate why and get that clearance in advance. And, and, and also, not, it's not that it's legislated in, in different territories, but certainly I'm seeing a preference with, with inspectors and tax audits for uh, more straightforward methods, maybe a transactional net margin method, or if we're not applying that cut. So that is one clear difference uh, that I would say to you know, some of the other jurisdictions where transfer pricing has been around for a number of years. I've, I've added here the factors of comparability. In the OECD, there are five factors of comparability. The, the US, the IRC co transfer pricing code has four, and Egypt and Saudi have actually added a sixth factor of comparability, and they're both different ones. So Egypt have added government regulations and control as a sixth factor of comparability, given the prevalence of, um, of governmental contracts in the region and regulated industries. And, and Saudi, and something I do agree with, the Saudi tax authorities have um, elevated risk to its own separate factor of comparability. So it's no longer embedded in, in FAR functions, assets and risks, but it's actually elevated to its own separate factor of comparability, given the importance of risk. Um, that we're seeing. So in terms of the analysis itself, those are the two uh, major differences. That we're <coughs> Rudolf, let me pause there. If you are there any questions that come to mind about that? Uh, thank you, Chief. Yeah, perhaps a practical one. Um, uh, the uh, the preferences that you just uh, touched upon are those uh, ministerial, uh, so to say, uh, uh, governmental level. Or um, can you also uh, uh, discuss out of practice that indeed th those preferences exist? Yeah, so the, the preference is, so in Qatar it's regulatory because you need to get that letter of approval. In other jurisdictions uh, like Saudi and Egypt, it's a, it's a preference we're seeing with the local tax authorities. So it's not a statutory preference, it's more of a preference that we're seeing in terms of audits uh, on the front line. Okay. The, another question we always get asked is around benchmarking. Can we use our global benchmarking analysis? And the answer is, you know, in, for a lot of the time, you are able to use global studies, global analysis that you have in place, uh, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, however, there is, like in every jurisdiction, there is a preference for local comparables. There, there's no statutory requirement. Like India is an example that I'd provide where you have to find six local comps. It used to be nine, I believe, and then it was relaxed to to six. And that, that often creates some some issues in trying to find a, a reliable set of, um, of comparables for certain industries. Um, so in the region, in the Middle East and Africa regions, we are seeing more and more local comparables. I think that the software is being updated now to include many more groups operating. <coughs> You can find some local comparables, but of course, if they are not available, then moving to Asia Pac or, you know, extending it to Europe or even further afield, um, you know, that that's something that should be looked at on a case by case basis, uh, depending on the economic fact pattern that you have in place. Uh, and what we often do is run an overlap range. So if you have a global set of comps that you're comfortable with, we may run a regional filter or a separate regional study uh, and just make sure that you're within the overlap of the two ranges and that's one way of keeping your core transfer pricing policy intact but also respecting some of the local uh, customs. Now again I mentioned this is not a statutory requirement 
it's a preference that's stated in many of the jurisdictions to to look for local comparables in the first instance. So quite often all that's required is that you, you, you show a rejection matrix uh, as part of your appendices and say we did look and then we had to move on because we couldn't find any. Yeah. Rudolf, you must have some questions about about that, I'm sure. That's something we get a lot. Uh, we got asked a lot from clients. Yeah. Thank you, Chief. Um, I think in the, um, uh, in the context of what you just uh, mentioned, uh, so um, for instance, if, if they're indeed um, on a quest to, uh, to finding local comps, uh, uh, your work might not be sufficient. Uh, how would you typically, uh, for instance, uh, uh, let's imagine a, a sales company uh, active out of Saudi Arabia uh, that you have identified as a say limited risk distributor, so a net margin on sales would do perfectly. You try to find local comps and within the industry uh, that is recognized in your study, you, you basically yeah, you, you don't seem to find enough comparables in, uh, in order to come up with a sustainable study. Uh, how would, would you then typically uh, try to broaden uh, your work? Would that be um, having a look at, at other countries uh, surrounding uh, this, this, uh, this very country or widening in the industry or, or a combination thereof? Yeah, and bear in mind the, the preference I've mentioned before about keeping things simple, as simple as possible as well, but accurate in this part of the world. And so my recommendation would be to, yes, look uh, at other jurisdictions, other regions, to see if you can find uh, close comparables. Um, and, and if not, Rudolf, then, you know, make an argument as to why a transactional net margin review is not appropriate in this case and how you have to rely upon other, other methods, other methodologies in place. But I, I go back to the point I mentioned, it needs to be on a case by case basis. I can't, uh, you know, lay down a, a doctrine for clients and saying, look, you know, if you use Asia Pack, you'll be safe. Or if you use European uh, Union, you'll be safe. It's, it's, it's not as straightforward as that. You need to think about uh, the case um, specifics that you have in that uh, for that client. But as I said, I, I've no wish to get multinational entities to redo uh, you know, their homework. I mean, if you have a good set of comparable studies that you rely upon for other parts of the world, that should always be your starting point, uh, perhaps with some local filters, regional filters, and then and then go from there. Yeah. Hey, thank you. And just a final point here is the definition of control. So there, there are jurisdictions such as Qatar, uh, Egypt that follow accounting um, definitions for when it comes to control. Uh, however, Saudi Arabia is one example where there's quite a wide reaching uh, definition of control, which has created some complexities for for, for clients who are working with operating in the region. Uh, they have tests of control by business, control by finance and control by governance. Uh, one of the most interesting ones is that control by business test where you have, if you're reliant on exclusive arrangements with suppliers, um, you know, economics, we call it monopsony as opposed to monopoly. Uh, that can create a control relationship, of course, uh, even though it may be uh, for all intents and purposes an arm's length relationship. So that's created some tax administration, uh, some, you know, for for companies that they have to deal with. But as I said, a, a, lot, a number of other jurisdictions are saying if you're connected from an accounting perspective, uh, then that's the starting point for from a transfer pricing perspective, which I think is uh, you know, something that a lot of groups would be would be com comfortable with in terms of definitions. Yeah. OK, we can uh, we can move on to the next slide. Well, oh, sorry, Rudolf, did you have any questions about control? Uh, um, yeah, well, perhaps uh, looking at, at, at companies, multinationals, uh, Chief, do you think they are uh, fully aware or moderately aware of what's going on, so to say, uh, having their control mechanisms um, uh, in order. Yeah, I think there's, there's two elements to this, isn't there? One is the initial review of what groups are associated um, and what should be included in the related party review. And then the second part is if you are looking at economic analysis and comparables, making sure that you set the, the independence criteria at the right level given the, the rules in that jurisdiction. So there's just two quite important elements as part of this. As I said, a lot of jurisdictions are using the accounting definition, so that shouldn't create too many issues. Um, I, I would say, uh, Rudolf, that yeah, that accounting, sorry, the, the effective control definition in Saudi has created a lot of issues for, for multinationals operating in the region. Uh, not as much because 
they're not aware of it, but because it's a lot of work to to review those different. I think there are 11 or 12 different tests that are into the fit into those three subcategories that I mentioned, and it's a lot of additional work to then find out that you know, the price is arm's length in any case. Um, so it's kind of a cyclical process that is that is followed at the moment um, for those particular um, effective control relationships. The, the most recent trench of guidance in Saudi Arabia has tried to address this by saying, look, if you can prove that any dealings are at arm's length, you know, a third party, uh, then you know we will relax a lot of that, um, uh, the requirement to look through that effective control definition. But you do have the situation where there is one one big buyer or two big buyers for a particular market uh, and that and they create those control relationships at all. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Shiv. No problem. So let's move on to the to the next slide here. The so another comparison that we see is the the documentation itself. So a lot of the jurisdictions have brought in this three tiered approach. And uh, what I mean by that of course is the the master file, the local file, and the country by country reporting. Uh, it's, it's worth mentioning here. So the UAE and Bahrain, I mentioned no corporate income tax at, at present, but they've introduced a country by country reporting requirement. Initially, when that was brought in, there was a requirement for multinational const, you know, constituent entities to notify in the UAE um, for country by country reporting. However, very recently that's been relaxed and now the focus is very much on UAE parented groups filing their reports and, and you know, multinational groups are not required to make that notification anymore. A uh, very similar approach was adopted in Qatar. Oman has just recently brought in the country by country reporting requirements and after an initial filing this year, uh, there may be another relaxation, a similar relaxation next year. So what we're seeing is that the CPCR regulations are focused squarely on uh, he you know, domestic headquartered groups, not foreign uh, MNEs who are operating in the region. The I mentioned the master file and the local file requirements as well. And, that, and that's good because that one master file should change for a group. You have one master file in place, maybe one for each operating division. Uh, that may be the case, but certainly that master file can be presented to uh, Morocco, Tunisia, to Saudi Arabia, to any of the tax authorities. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll come on to the language of submission shortly, but it's it's good that there's no separate requirement to to do anything to that master file. The local file, of course, needs to look at the local entity itself. There are some uh, requirements. I think Egypt is one example where you need to have a separate local file for every taxable entity, uh, which again is um, is non-standard for a lot of multinational groups who may look to have one local file covering all of their operations in a particular particular territory. But but as I say, that's good news that the, the three-tiered approach has been adopted by uh, by regions. Uh, sorry, uh, the jurisdictions here. The, the language of submission could be Portuguese, French, Arabic, English, depending on the, the jurisdiction. Uh, in some circumstances, that's mandatory. Uh, in others, it's it's recommended. Uh, one thing we do see, though, is that um, the tax authorities themselves are hiring, uh, you know, very strong inspectors from uh, from industry, from practice and from other tax authorities around the world. So, you know, their, their primary language might be English, for example. So even if we submit something in Arabic, it may need to be translated uh, for the actual transfer pricing inspector to to review it in uh, in the first instance. So the language of submission is an important thing to monitor. Uh, obviously, a certified translation isn't overly expensive, but the concern is that it may lose something in the translation. So that's an important point uh, to keep your reports nice and sleek uh, so that when you translate them, you can uh, you won't lose any uh, any of that in the translation itself. But that can cause some uh, some complexities, Rudolf, in the in the region, of course. I've got here as well the submission of documentation. So some jurisdictions around the world, uh, many in fact, now have a summary as part of the tax returns. So Spain, uh, Australia have long had the Schedule 25 form, um, but that's very common in the region for now. The tax return to have a summary form which summarizes all of the transfer pricing uh, documentation and stuff. Um, so and that's kind of whether it's called a disclosure form or a questionnaire that is filed as part of the tax return itself. 
uh, other jurisdictions such as Egypt, Cameroon, most recently Qatar for groups above I think 15 million US dollars of um, uh, related party transactions, sorry of uh, turnover and assets, anything above that level um, you'd have to actually file your documentation with the tax authorities every year. So for many years multinationals would have spoken to me and said I can't do local files in 100 locations can I concentrate on these five? And the answer was invariably yes, concentrate on the, the high risk material complex jurisdictions. However, if you have to submit the documentation or if you have to tick a little box saying that your documentation is in place, then you know that suddenly changes the dynamic and you really need to prepare those files and have them put, put in place. Um, so that can, again can create some, some resource burdens for, uh, for multinationals operating in the region. Another point about the submissions with the tax returns themselves. In Saudi, there was an interesting uh, introduction of an affidavit which is signed by advisors, uh, which says that the transfer pricing policy has been adhered to. So that, that's an interesting uh, change of um, an interesting dynamic, I would say, that the, the KSA regulations brought in. And it really requires a review of the, the transfer pricing policy to make sure that it's actually being adhered to. So those those two final items there's the submission of the documentation and the actual transfer pricing declarations that you make with the tax return that that creates uh, an additional amount of work for MNEs and something that they need to really focus on let me pause there Rudolf that's a lot of information can I uh, any questions for that about that okay thank you um, Shif um, uh, yeah, w w one practical question perhaps on, on this topic and um, uh, after I've dealt with that there is well there, there's a number of questions even uh, that popped in about benchmarking uh, studies just now and mm. uh, I will select uh, well at least one of them for you to go in um, in, in just a second on on the uh, documentation um, um, part uh, Shiv uh, let us imagine uh, a country where there is no corporate income tax levy yet at this mm. point in time what would be the main gain knowing that this this uh, this rack is around uh, locally already uh, what would be the main gain for a multinational to properly deal with documentation uh, would that be uh, for instance to to stay out of uh, um, uh, tax audits on, on other areas like uh, VAT or customs or so or the like uh, or would you basically wish to be prepared uh, for as soon as uh, corporate income tax uh, kicks in so or would you simply wish to avoid penalties or so uh, what would be the main gain in order to uh, to come up with documentation knowing that multinationals have a lot of homework to do uh, and on top of that long list uh, uh, comes then this this area this documentation set as well um, uh, perhaps you, you take that in one go with the, uh, the the question on benchmarking studies sorry for the others uh, I selected just one mm -hmm. um, uh, question uh, is what are the databases that would be preferred by the authorities mm -hmm. considering the GCC is more focused on distribution businesses that's the uh, at least what the, uh, the participant has, uh, has requested here are there any special measures for benchmarking them I think the, the last uh, item we briefly discussed but a preference uh, perhaps not uh, on documentation indeed uh, are there any penalties in not fulfilling the TKP doc uh, requirements Thank you, Chief. Yeah, no, thank you. So, so let's take uh, both of those questions. Very good questions. So the the the, the first point about um, why you would need to do transfer pricing documentation in a jurisdiction with no corporate income tax, you, you don't have to do that. That's not um, something that's required at all. Um, the the only thing that's been brought in in the UAE and Bahrain, the jurisdictions where there's no corporate income tax, is an economic substance requirement under Action Five. Uh, and then the country by country reporting, which I mentioned has now been relaxed for foreign uh, multinationals operating in the region. So there's not a huge amount of transfer pricing issues um, that you need to deal with from a UAE perspective. So there's nothing that would necessitate documentation here. The fact that the corporation tax might come in, you know, I don't know any clients that have asked me, no clients have asked me to put together any documentation in view of a corporation tax rate that might be coming in. That's not happening. You know, if the corporate tax rate is introduced, we will address it as and when we need to. Uh, but that's not something we're doing as a preemptive measure at all. Uh, however, I would say that there have been uh, circumstances, and I'm working with one 
client in particular, whether it's a, a European uh, parent group that's been challenged in their home territory um, and challenged unfairly uh, in terms of the UAE is on the other side and perhaps the tax authority felt that, you know, the map process here is not as um, not as well trodden upon. Uh, and maybe they've gone a little bit overboard in what they may try to recoup from a transfer pricing adjustment. So in those circumstances, we may then look at what's happening in the UAE and try to balance it uh, and try to ensure that whatever is happening in the, you know, whatever the tax authorities uh, are arguing in the home territory, we have a counter argument that shows the economic substance and support here in the UAE. And I've seen that on a you know, handful of occasions with uh, with European tax fisks. So that's one uh, one area that might necessitate that. Uh, now to come to the second point about the, the software. So the, the tax authorities here use the, the full suite of software. So they'll use Bloomberg, OneSource, One um, Thomson Reuters, BBD. I hope I'm not missing out any, uh, any of the software companies. Apologies to any of them if I've missed any of them out. But they, they use the full suite of of software. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any preference. As I said, it will often depend. I, I think the question had part of the answer in it about, you know, distributors and if you have software that can can help you find those comparables, independent comparables, then that's something you should always put in front of the, the tax authorities if you're able to to demonstrate those uh, those comps. Yeah. Sorry, was that the full question? Was there any yeah, other? Was I think so. Second? Thank oh, you. No. Okay. no problem. OK, very good. Should we, we move on to the next uh, next slide? OK, so what causes uh, a transfer price? I, I guess this kind of gets to the heart of it in terms of, you know, why why should transfer pricing documentation be created? You know, what what is the real issue here in the uh, in, in the region? So obviously we have the regulations that have been brought in. Uh, as I said, there are requirements to submit documentation or a tax ruling, sorry, not a, tax, a summary of um, the tax information within the tax return itself. So what's causing the, the audits themselves? Now, we have a concept here of tax neutrality that a lot of uh, listeners will be, be aware of, and, and that's embedded in the regulations in a lot of jurisdictions. So Egypt actually state, not even in the guidance, but in the income tax law, that if something is tax neutral, then transfer pricing shouldn't apply. So if that if that transaction doesn't lead to a tax disadvantage, really a tax saving for the for the MNE is what we're talking about, then that won't trigger a transfer pricing uh, requirement. And that tax neutrality concept is is really important. And and Qatar brought in something similar in the guidance that came out very recently, where they said that if there's no related party transaction, then transfer pricing won't be an issue. And, th and these sound like obvious points, but they, we see all over the world that these things aren't addressed in regulations and then domestic transactions get caught up in the whole transfer pricing remit. Uh, and we do see that in some territories in the Middle East you have, you have to include domestic transactions within your transfer pricing review process. And, and they may, it may not be tax neutral, of course, you may have losses in place. Um, so what I'm talking about with bullet point one is if you really have a tax neutral transaction, then that is important in balancing risk and resource uh, and arguing that transfer pricing isn't as an issue here because of that tax neutrality element and that's an important um, important item that we're finding in guidance and regulations regulations in the region losses themselves and lean margins will always be a um, I'm going to say easy pickings for want of a better phrase but tax if tax authorities see losses for a number of years low margins they're going to think the transfer pricing might not be correct and that's going to always trigger uh, a challenge. There may be exceptions, uh, market penetration strategies, uh, early years, uh, the current environment obviously as well. So there may be exceptions to that, but certainly losses and lean margins are, are likely to lead to challenges. The, the third bullet point here, so you know, healthy profitable groups aren't immune. So obviously we sometimes see those groups being challenged, but because of permanent establishments or potentially withholding tax rather than the transfer pricing margins themselves. But of course, the those audits can start out as a transfer pricing, transfer pricing um, fact finding exercise. And, and I've put it business restructurings. Those tax return disclosures that I mentioned quite often have a 
a box that says, have you had any business restructurings during the year? If you tick it, you suddenly go into a onto a pile where you may be audited because that's considered to be high risk as well. So those are the key triggers, I would say, for uh, for transfer pricing audits. And there are a lot of transfer pricing audits in, in Saudi and Africa. We're likely to see those in Egypt next year and Qatar as well. Uh, so, you know, they are increasing uh, at quite an astronomical rate, I would say. And I have a number of dispute resolution cases and tax rulings that we're putting through to, to help address that. Yeah. So here, this is audit triggers from a European perspective. Rudolf, how does that uh, compare to your experience? Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, yeah, uh, I think it it uh, it is um, good to know that these uh, triggers already exist in in the region, so to say, because uh, the Western European take might be a bit different uh, to look at the combination of low tax uh, jurisdictions uh, in combination with high value type of transactions uh, like IP. Uh, finance transactions or uh, even headquartered service, typically management uh, type of, of service. That would be uh, uh, yeah, a set of triggers that we even commonly see uh, uh, out, of, out of Western Europe, uh, not only to your region, but to other uh, low tax jurisdictions as well. Uh, some beautiful islands uh, uh, throughout the world, for instance. Um, what, what, what would be your take, um, uh, Chief, going forward? Huh? Uh, let, let's take a leap uh, for the next two or three, three years. How do you think that um, um, that, that uh, local advisors, uh, means uh, someone on the ground like you, for instance, could assist a multinational uh, with a tax audit uh, out of Western Europe uh, on, for instance, a, a headquarter uh, scheme uh, arrangement? Yeah, thanks, Rudolf. I think the, it leads nicely into the, the final point here about the availability of tax rulings. And whenever you have a dispute resolution in, in place, one uh, you know one good strategy to look at is, is always to think about whether you can get an agreement, a ruling uh, on that going forward. Um, so you're already under the microscope, so it's a good opportunity to, to thrash out some of the subjective areas of your transfer pricing while you are face to face with the tax inspector tax authorities and agree the position going forward for the next maybe three to five years. So one thing I would recommend certainly is if you are being audited to think about whether a tax ruling uh, would be an appropriate strategy. Uh, they have unilateral at the moment. Uh, we don't have a, a huge multilateral APA program here in the Middle East and Africa, but you can get unilateral rulings in half a dozen of these key locations now and then we have a number of those APAs, unilateral APAs that we're putting through uh, at the moment, uh, which is obviously very positive uh, that these that the facility exists. Now, if you've not had that audit again, uh, it may be important to think about getting a ruling in advance of that as well. If there are, um, if it's material, if you feel there are some subjective elements here, it's something to to think about as a strategy. So the, the other thing I would say, Rudolph, as well, is that um, you know, getting the jurisdictions talking to each other uh, is in the, under the map process. You know, we, we that needs to be something that, as advisors and as businesses, as MNEs, we we try to assist and support because that, that's in its infancy in this part of the world, and and we know that, and that can be frustrating for a lot of MNEs. But you know, the more of those map discussions that take place. The, the better it will be for everybody uh, in terms of um, you know improving the flow of communication. I always think that a transparent approach is the best approach. I worked as a head of tax many years ago, and uh, you know my dealings with tax authorities, even from from that side, and as an advisor, I think the transparent approach is really important, Rudolf. And that's no that's no exception here in the uh, in the Middle East and Africa as well. That's also something that should be considered. I would say. OK, thank you, Chief. Uh, no problem. The, did you have a perspective on that? I know in, in Europe, Rudolf, the state aid challenges uh, have kind of led to a reduction in APAs. Now, obviously, the, you know, the, the taxpayer was ultimately successful in the, in the most yeah. recent uh, EU courts, but I know that that led to a tail off in, in certain rulings being sought. I don't know, how does that bounce back now? Are you seeing more, more rulings being sought? 
Yeah, good, good question with, with all sorts of flavors, I think, still uh, uh, looking at the Western European perspective, uh, chief and, and participants. Uh, I think on, on a generic note, um, uh, APAs uh, are still around and rightfully so because uh, same as in your jurisdiction, it does give comfort to taxpayers as to their tax position for say the next three or five years. Typically, uh, on the other hand, um, the bandwidth in, in which we may operate uh, APAs has become uh, way smaller, uh, uh, narrower uh, than, than in the past. Um, uh, what, what is certainly uh, the case currently is that in, in the APA programs, um, the documentation set locally with the tax inspector dealing with uh, an APA or a bilateral APA, for instance, uh, um, uh, needs to consist of way more information than in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if in late, let's say 15 years ago, it was even possible to conclude an APA without a benchmark study, because an LRD was typically uh, remunerated properly at 3% margin, uh, stamp, here you go. Uh, some seven years ago, you needed to have a benchmark study. Uh, currently, uh, questions do come up as to provide an additional economic study on top of a benchmark study in order to be really precise for that inspector to, uh, to, to, um, um, uh, to, to give his uh, approval to an APA request. Uh, then again, that, that, that basically means that, that APAs are still being professionalized, also uh, with a tax uh, inspector, and that, uh, that does mean that the M&E should uh, be prepared more thoroughly than in the past. Mm. Um, looking at, uh, at the Western Europe um, uh, angle towards your region, uh, Chief, then obviously uh, uh, we have to deal with uh, environments low tax uh, 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 corporate, corporate income tax rate, so to say, uh, and that uh, may be a pitfall for, uh, for various APA programs currently. Um, however, uh, we do uh, see some, some uh, nice developments uh, rising out of your region, like thinking of corporate income tax, thinking of OECD uh, measurements, uh, thinking of uh, being economically active, uh, uh, really on the ground, for instance, uh, and also the position on a blacklist, obviously, is of uh, is of importance. So it's it's definitely a um, uh, an exciting, I, I might even say, uh, environment uh, to be active in, uh, and I'm anxious um, uh, to see um, what the near future might bring us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we've got one more slide on pillar one and pillar two, and then we can go to some some questions. Um, okay, so the, the impact in the region, uh, I, I guess, um, so let's talk about the direct impact here and then we can talk about some of the indirect elements. The, you have a large consumer market here, I mean, a huge consumer base. So jurisdictions uh, such as Saudi Arabia and Egypt, you know, we have a very, very populous, large number of consumers would you know, be potential beneficiaries of pillow whereas the UAE where you have uh, only 10 million people uh, obviously um, a lot like Switzerland Singapore you know they're less likely to be uh, have positive impact from pillow because of the users etc and this concept of taxing rights based on consumption uh, and users and, and so obviously that would have a direct impact on how uh, regional hubs might be structured uh, but of course that can be reflected in the in the transfer pricing as well the the complexity of the tax administration is the more indirect challenge that a lot of groups are going to have to deal with um, you know a lot of MNEs are already getting to grip still with IFRS VAT transfer pricing regulations economic substance and this is going to add an additional level of of complexity from a tax administration perspective so I think that's going to be quite tough for a lot of groups to deal with as well on pillar pillar one P pillar two and you know I, I guess this is really the question i get asked the most about whether there'll be a corporate income tax rate brought in um, to the ue so let's see if we can answer that for our for our listeners before pillar two was even mentioned um you, you imagine the set of scales where you know on my left hand side we're saying these are the arguments for bringing in corporation tax and these are the arguments for not bringing in corporation tax. So let's say we were we were clearly here every year. It had been discussed, but you know, no corporate income tax had been brought in for a number of years. So the introduction of pillar two has brought that, um, I would say, to a fine balance now. 
And, and if Pillar 2 is brought in, um, you, you will have a situation where if profits in the UAE are going to be after taxed at 12.5% elsewhere, then you would imagine the Ministry of Finance here would bring in a 12.5% corporation tax. Uh, you know, on the on the basis that why should those profits be taxed elsewhere? If they're going to have to be taxed somewhere, it should be taxed here. And and, and in doing so, that might save a lot of the tax administrative uh, burdens that would come in from an income exclusion rule, under tax payment switch over, subject to tax rule, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and so I think if so, in, there would be an administrative saving for groups, but obviously you'd be hit with the with the twelve and a half percent tax rate. So my, my Rudolph, and you know, uh, you may get a different view from other advisors. Is that if Pillar Two does come through, you will see a twelve and a half percent, or whatever the rate is brought out, corporate tax in the UAE and potentially Bahrain, and and you may see Qatar and uh, and other jurisdictions that are slightly below that increasing their rates to the twelve and a half percent level as well. So I'm trying to be clear and and sorry, give as clear an answer I can to that to that question. Yeah. I don't know how does how does that sit from a European perspective? Okay, thank you, Chief. Um, uh, well, this is obviously this is a quite extensive um, uh, topic uh, for which we uh, do run uh, uh, separate uh, webinars uh, uh, again uh, to go early next year. Um, I, th I think um, uh, a generic Western European view, not, not so much different than yours, is obviously on pillar one. Uh, the, the main question would be, uh, is this going to fly uh, at all? Uh, uh, we have seen obviously uh, in various stages uh, uh, th this this program uh, being professionalized uh, and brought to uh, to the public. Um, uh, I think lucky uh, for uh, for multinationals is is that the language in the in the last phases has shifted towards a more common transfer pricing language uh, like residual profit, market intelligence, and stuff like that. So that's good. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it, it, it's uh, it's a it's a difficult matter um, uh, to deal with for each and every uh, multinational. And the question I think uh, out of uh, Western Europe on this one, uh, Shiv, is is mainly uh, how to prepare for pillar one. Uh, if 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 you think that you are part of the uh, the uh, the group of multinationals uh, that um, uh, that will be. Uh, part of this scheme uh, as from 2022 going forward. How could you at all uh, be, be, be prepared for that? Uh, same goes to a certain extent for pillar two, uh, but that's uh, that's uh, something that we can slightly more easily define, I guess, uh, the corporate income tax um, uh, measures uh, that, that are about to be taken here. Uh, and on this one, indeed, uh, we are more or less awaiting uh, the steps that a region like yours uh, is going to make in the next one or two years. So, um, so both on political grounds as on more material uh, grounds for a multinational, indeed we, we do see yeah, similar questions uh, arise. Um, a question for you perhaps here on this one, um, how do you think um, or is, that, or is that not um, uh, not so much uh, a thought at all? Uh, local uh, governments uh, may interact with the pillar one ID has to come up has to come up with local sales uh, tax measures, like for instance France has done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's uh, it's a good question. I'm sorry, I jumped straight to the answer. Uh, I didn't walk through the the process, but you're you spot on. The the digital economy is increasing uh, exponentially in this part of the world. Uh, you know, like everywhere, Rudolph, the, the current COVID situation has, has necessitated a lot more online digital platforms for, for businesses that were even more traditional. Um, so we're seeing an expansion in the digital business space, but also more traditional businesses are embracing that digital technology much more uh, efficiently than they have been in the past. They've been forced to, to do that this year. So a lot of groups will be impacted by Pillar 1, just to answer your first question about the digital economy. And then the second point as well is that the, the corporate income tax, it won't be brought in just for digital businesses, it'll be brought in for all businesses. So that, that's an important point. Um, you know, it won't be just for one industry and not for for others. So that's something I think that needs to be really, really factored in, uh, you know, when, when looking at these sort of these sort of items. The 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 rate itself, I mentioned 12 and a half percent is something that's been discussed, but the there hasn't been and for pillar one, there hasn't been the the 
the knee-jerk reaction, I would say, to bring in sales tax, sorry, digital taxes in the region uh, thus far. So I know the UK jumped the gun a little bit and brought in a digital tax, um, you know, very early on in the process. That hasn't happened in the region uh, thus far. It's being discussed. Uh, all of those IF, um, I mentioned the four minimum standards, but the IF commitment is also for pillar one and for pillar two, and that's an important point uh, that everybody should bear in mind. So there, these jurisdictions are at this discussion table, and we'll be seeing the, you know, these dis, these taxes that are being brought into your question, Rudolph. So we may see something being brought in in some of the larger economies, but nothing's happened thus far. My sense is that. Uh, the jurisdictions will wait and see what uh, the recommendations are and then act um, unilaterally, sorry, not act unilaterally and bring in something which is consistent with, with the OECD approach. That would be uh, my hope and my view just from what I'm seeing in the region thus far on other areas of tax law. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Very Chief. No, no problem. Do we have time for any other questions? Is there uh, else yeah. I think so. Uh, this this may be a bit of generic question, but it's a really nice one, uh, Chief. Um, so this is apparently a multinational out of Western Europe that's uh, making uh, the, the, their ways to the Middle East, and they are seeking uh, also for tax and transfer pricing purposes a um, a sustainable, say, stepping stone. Uh, in any country uh, surrounding your office, uh, uh, Chief, to, to serve indeed as a stepping stone for the rest of, of um, uh, Middle East. And, and what would be your pick is basically the question. Yeah, so the, the UAE performs very well in, uh, I mean, if you think about not even from a tax perspective, if you look at, you know, ease of doing business and, you know, World Bank uh, studies for foreign direct investment, so the, the, the UAE uh, and Dubai specifically and Abu Dhabi, they perform very, very well when compared to Singapore and Switzerland, Luxembourg and other traditional hubs that may be applied. Um, you have access to a skilled workforce, Arabic speaking, of course. So if you're investing into Arabic speaking countries, the UAE again is a, is a strong contingent for that as well. So the UAE is often applied as as a regional hub, um, I would say, uh, and the you know even the, lo the low corporation tax, uh, sorry, the zero corporation tax, of course, is a factor as part of that. But even if uh, twelve and a half percent is brought in, that would still be um, comparable to what you see in Ireland and other parts of the world. Uh, I think uh, the most recent U.S. Um, president uh, Biden is planning to increase the the U.S. corporation tax rate to maybe twenty nine percent. Uh, and so there's still high tax jurisdictions around the world and 12 and a half is still a, uh, I would say a low jurisdiction to make it uh, make it worthwhile. So I would say, have a look at those studies. I can, I'm happy to say the links, but those are IMF, World Bank, and they and they rank the, the UAE very highly um, on that scale. However, if you want to access a large young consumer base, then uh, I would say Saudi Arabia, Egypt, some of these markets have a huge consumer base. And that's not a tax comment, that's more of an economic uh, uh, comment about the region itself. And so we do see some companies investing directly into, into those regions as well, uh, I would say, Rudolf. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chief. Uh, for our participants, there are some five minutes left. If you do have uh, any other question, uh, please uh, send us a brief message uh, as, as uh, uh, discussed before. There is this uh, also a bit of generic question, but it's a nice one again, uh, Chief. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your uh, experience uh, when dealing with tax offices? Uh, mm -hmm. locally, that means you're in, in other jurisdictions, I think, uh, seemingly a multinational out of Western Europe again, uh, trying to imagine how life is when dealing with um, uh, tax authorities, also for, uh, uh, for VAT uh, purposes and stuff. Is that, uh, if you're a, a good taxpayer, is that um, uh, a doable job uh, or can life be critical for, for for elements uh, yeah, beyond our uh, technical knowledge, so to say. Yeah, the my experience with tax authorities in in the region, Middle East and Africa is, is positive. Um, you know, in term, and for a number of reasons. Number one, you the regulations and the guidance, as I mentioned before, are respecting the OECD framework, which is positive. 
the speed of response is positive, so we're getting good response and dialogue and communication uh, on rulings and on dispute resolution as well. So that's been positive also. So uh, the point I mentioned before about transparency, I, I wouldn't be recommending that if things were taking a long time and we weren't getting um, obviously um, you know, good transparency over trans over the transfer pricing regulations and the OECD guidance consistency that is. So I, the reason I'm recommending that is because I do see a lot of positives uh, and, and also in terms of the guidance and the legislation itself. Tax authorities, the ministries of finance have reached out to advisors such as myself for assistance with, you know, with helping craft the, re the legislation, the guidance itself. Uh, and they are speaking to advisors and businesses before they release the regulations as well, uh, which again is very positive to see that uh, they, they're testing it essentially before it is released. And that's obviously a good, uh, a good thing. So obviously it's not like any jurisdiction around the world. And I think I like that question because if you are a good taxpayer, uh, then you will have good dialogue with your tax authorities. So filing on time and, and doing your homework, having a good set of robust documentation, that's always going to help with that dialogue for transparency. But if you leave some of these things for tax authorities to find, uh, then it can switch completely to the other side. And, and we are seeing that, um, you know, if a permanent establishment is a good example, if you come forward with a voluntary permanent establishment registration that's seen as very favorable. However, if the tax authorities find something, they may go back 10 years and uh, you know that can be quite tough. So I, it's very, it's binary. A lot of people that have worked with me in the past would have heard me say this, but tax authorities can be quite binary. You either on a, a naughty list or a nice list, a, a good list or a, or a bad list. So try to be on that good list to root off is what I would say. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chief. Um, just one swift question just came up. Will there be a recording of the session? Uh, well, if the technique allows us to, uh, there is going to be one. Uh, so far, I think we have been able to um, to put on, on our website uh, a recording of, of any uh, webinar that we have dealt with so far. Um, there uh, have been a few other questions as well uh, to which we have responded. Well, please do send us a brief uh, email because it, it's really uh, a tweak towards a typical uh, multinational. Um, then, uh, yeah, then we come to the, the thank you um, uh, page and the upcoming webinars. So this is the thank you page. Uh, for the three of us, thank you very much for being with us today on this um, on this um, uh, yeah extraordinary I might uh, say topic beyond uh, the regular pace like pillar one and pillar two that we did touch upon though. Uh, thank you very much, Chief, uh, for Craigus um, uh, Group uh, for being with us today. Uh, Craigus Group, ladies and gentlemen, is a uh, business partner of us uh, for the region that Chief has. Um, uh, has elaborated on. Um, uh, those are contact details, so any question that you may still have a non-committal, please um, uh, do reach out to us. Um, final page, upcoming webinars, briefly, uh, quick look out for what's coming up. Uh, what to expect for 2021, uh, that is basically a second uh, webinar in conclusion to one that we have dealt with some four weeks ago. Uh, when dealing with the uh, uh, late uh, 2020 uh, measures you may wish to take. So this is about the outlook for next year. Then the webinars for, for next year without uh, a date that has been set at this point in time, but those would be the topics um, at, at this point. So uh, again, digital economy, uh, so pillar one, here we go. Uh, IP, uh, one of the of the major takes in transfer pricing still. Uh, the good hope for our Dutch listeners, um, uh, op hoop van zegen. Our thoughts about current uh, transfer pricing uh, developments. Uh, two webinars on risk uh, management, one tweak to compliance and your organization and one to APAs and MAPS. Uh, a critical one as Chief uh, rightfully explained in throughout our webinar. Uh, there's going to be some country specific webinars as well, uh, like this one has, has been. Um, so thank you so much. Chief, uh, over to you for a final farewell for this take. Yes, thanks Rudolf. Yeah, just again to reiterate that, thank you to everybody for 
for dialing in and staying with us <laughs> throughout the hour as well. Much appreciated and uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you, everyone.